Dear colleagues and friends, on behalf of the team of my co-workers and co-authors, I welcome you to our presentation on geometrical accuracy in incremental sheet forming. Our goal today is to give a classification of mechanisms and geometry deviation types, as well as to propose an idea how we could solve together these questions in future. Quite some parts of the presentation will be well known to some of you, but I hope that the chosen structure and the conclusions and the outlook will be of interest also for those who have longer experience in the process. We all know that incremental sheet forming has economic potential for low volume production, especially due to the low tooling costs and lower investment costs. And we all also know the potential applications, like the historical racing car on the right hand side, of which we have produced several variants. Or other applications, maybe like shape prototypes, like medical implants, or aerospace applications, which can be produced in a fully integrated process. You may watch this process later following the production video link here, if you like. Other applications could be in design as well as in architecture, like the demonstrator on top, which is now already eight years old. Below you see the concept for our next demonstrator, which we plan to complete this year, and which shall have a smooth surface on the inner and on the outer shell. We have obviously seen suitable application scenarios and we can calculate economic feasibility. So we must ask ourselves, what are the reasons that the industrial application is still limited? To our opinion, the main reasons are a lack of product accuracy and a lack of process planning tools for accuracy, which exist for other processes. The video shows our car panel process planning which is fully virtual. We define individual components fitting to the machine size. There is software to test the stretch forming motions. There's commercial software to simulate the stretch forming process. And there are efficient algorithms to determine the part that requires incremental forming. In other words, there are suitable and efficient models for all classical process steps. But, if we want to simulate the incremental sheet forming, we either need very long simulation times or we are limited to simple geometries. The geometric tolerances that are required strongly depend on the field of application and on the size of the component. In 2005, Julian Allwood has published a result of his inquiry which is still valid today. Those of us who are working also in classical sheet forming know that also there deviations occur which may be larger than these values. But for deep drawing and stamping we have an immense basis of experience and we have well established process simulation tools. These tools can simulate in very short time. Accordingly they can even be used to assess process robustness and give the expected geometric deviations when material input changes, as it is shown on this right-hand figure. There also is a tremendous amount of publications which at least partly cover accuracy in incremental sheet metal forming. These papers describe typical geometric defects like curling, wrinkles, bulges, waves and so on. They also list influencing factors like forming speed, tool diameter, pitch, friction and so on. And some of them mention physical mechanisms which may be classified as being active on the macro scale or on the micro scale, like residual stresses, for example. Our feeling, however, is that there is still a lack of common understanding of the different physical mechanisms causing specific geometric deviations, and there also is a lack of common language. Let me therefore narrow down the target for our presentation today. 
Firstly, we want to focus on single point incremental forming and on two point incremental forming with just one moving tool. Secondly, we want to limit our considerations to defects which occur even though the tool path was perfectly maintained and even though the geometries can be realized by incremental sheet forming with sufficient remaining sheet thickness. This means we do not consider a lack of machine tool stiffness, tool deflections, etc., which are either small or can be compensated by given algorithms. And we are not considering formability limits and thinning because we assume that they are sufficiently well understood. With this focus, let me now ask two questions, which at least my group and I cannot answer. The first question is, does any toolpath exist that can achieve a given and desired accurate target geometry by incremental sheet forming? This toolpath could be any arbitrary sequence of contact points far beyond sea level contours, which we create today with CAD CAM software. And the second question is, if this toolpath exists, how can we find it? Well, I cannot answer these questions today and instead I want to propose a framework which we may use as a starting point for collaborative efforts. The first step is a proposal for a classification of the appearance of geometric deviations that we observe. And the second step is a proposal for a preliminary list of mechanisms of which we assume that even within our narrow focus they lead to the before described deviations. We hope this will form a basis to structure further discussions in this field. Accordingly, the third step is a proposal how we can stimulate a broader, open and effective data exchange among the research groups. If we connect ourselves inside a virtual worldwide lab, we should be more efficient in learning from each other and we should be faster to overcome the lack of common experience. <clears throat> Having said this, let us now summarize selected geometric defects in incremental sheet forming. We frequently observe what we could call angular springback as shown in this figure. We also observe what we called curling which is a curvature which may occur towards the tool or away from the tool. I think we all have seen draw-in, which usually occurs due to deformation outside of the deformation zone. And we have seen radii, which reflect eventually the tool diameter instead of the part design. The next category are multi-axle, surface elevations and distortions. Here the pillow effect is discussed frequently. We observe bulges on the part surface which can either face inwards or outwards. We see waves which cross the desired contour several times. We see wrinkles which may form self-contact. We see edge waves or global twist as shown here on the bottom left. What was schematically shown in the slide before can in reality be seen here on a simple pyramidal shape from our architectural demonstrator. We see curling, wrinkling, waves perpendicular to the toolpath or global twist. And I assume that many of us are aware of some of the underlying mechanisms and many of us also know how some of these defects can be avoided. Let me now as a second step describe some of the physical mechanisms. In single point incremental forming, we may easily see that plastic deformation occurs outside the originally planned forming zone. For example, while we are forming the bottom of this component, the originally formed angle here is stretched to the non-desired geometry. 
This happens whenever the required forming force induces a global stress which is sufficiently large to create plastic deformation in other positions of the workpiece. What we can observe in this video is elastic deflection of the workpiece during the forming operation. This elastic deflection implies that the plastic deformation applied is lower than what was originally planned. Accordingly, it leads to a final geometry deviation. When we talk about geometric deviations in sheet metal forming, we tend to use the word springback for many different things. But basically it means that there is elastic recovery of a fraction of the plastic deformation that was applied. If this happens in the plane of the sheet, then the elastic recovery of the stretches is usually small compared to the component dimensions. But if the elastic recovery creates changes in angle or in curvature, then we observe large global displacement, which we denote as springback. There is quite a bit of literature explaining that incremental sheet forming is not a pure projection of material, but that it also involves other forming modes, and one of them is bending. Whenever bending occurs, then there is an inhomogeneous strain and stress over the thickness, and we will observe a change in angle after unloading. There is also literature explaining that while the tool is moving, continuous bending and elastic springback occurs as it is indicated in this figure. We may now argue whether this mechanism causes the final bulge or if the bulge is created by another mechanism. To my opinion, the existence of this bulge is a precondition to observe the backward and forward bending. At least springback cannot be the reason for the bulge, because springback does not stretch the material. However, stretching or elongation is required to create sufficient surface for the bulge. So there must be some other reasons which create excessive in-plane stretching. Springback, however, does not only happen during the process. Uh, it happens very often after the process, either upon unclamping or after trimming. Assuming that the curling, which we see here again, can be denoted as springback, then various researchers have observed positive as well as negative springback, meaning that springback may occur towards the tool or away from the tool. How can a similar type of movement once create a curvature towards the tool and in another case a curvature away from the tool? Can we learn from other processes? If we look at short pin forming, then this effect is well known. Depending on the impact energy, the plastic zone is either located in the upper half of the workpiece, leading to a convex shape, or the plastic zone is penetrating through the workpiece, as shown here, leading to a concave shape. Roman Schmitz showed how this compiles to incremental sheet forming in a set of very simple experiments. In his experiments, a selection of which I'm going to show, he varied the tool intrusion depth as well as the tool path when forming a flat sheet so that it should remain a flat sheet. As we can see, in this case, the flat sheet does not remain flat but creates a curvature which can well be explained by similar mechanisms as just in short pin forming. Using another tool pass design, but still with longitudinal movements and keeping all other parameters constant, now shows a different appearance of the curvature, which is even much stronger. And the third tool pass design is the same as number one, but turned by 90 degrees. Due to the frame rate in the video, the lateral movements are not represented, but the effect can nevertheless be seen. 
Now the tool pushes material ahead and creates a fold at the end of the workpiece. All the three toolpaths just cover the surface of the sheet in a way that it should stay flat. The process parameters have been the same intrusion taps, the same pitch from line to line, the same tool diameter and so on. They just vary in strategy. And so already this extremely simple example using three different toolpath strategies for the same target geometry creates completely different forming results. How can we handle this in a complicated 3D geometry? Many authors have proposed various forms of correcting algorithms. Most of them are based on the idea of overforming, which is helpful to compensate springback in classical sheet metal forming. Also, this very early work from our group appeared to be helpful when not looking into too much detail. Obviously, the general deviation could clearly be reduced and the bulge appears to be smaller. But looking into more detail, we see that the original bulge has been transformed in a higher order wave. The reason is obvious. The bulge is a result of excessive in-plane stretch, which occurred even though the shortest possible toolpath was used. Why should a longer, overforming toolpath lead to less stretch? So the algorithm reduces symptoms, but it does not heal reasons. Another well-known reason causing geometric deviation is strain-induced phase transformation. Especially in some stainless steels, this occurs at room temperature. In this example, it's a strain-induced matensitic transformation. This transformation leads to local density change, results in high residual stresses and may end up in extreme distortions after trimming. The list of mechanisms causing defects in ESF presented so far may not yet be complete. But I think we have covered some of the most important ones, taking into account our focus area. There is plastic deformation outside the contact zone. There is elastic part deflection during the process. There are geometry changes due to transformation-induced phase changes. There is what is often called springback, meaning the release of regular elastic part of local deformation. And there are geometric inaccuracies induced by, homogeneous, by inhomogeneous local material flow, like excessive in-plane stretching or convex, convex, convex or concave curvature, as we have seen in the flat specimen. These are complicated interrelations. They are composed of different sub-mechanisms, which we did not discuss today, and I'm afraid we haven't yet understood most of them. If we now add the geometric defects described before to this figure and relate them with these mechanisms, then we see that most of the defects are related to more than one of the mechanisms, but fortunately not to all of them. And let us now include the influencing factors, which are too many to read them now, but they are covering the process parameters, the machine parameters, the sheet material characteristics. And immediately we see the high complexity of the system. There are high cross influences, and which of these connections is a strong one or which is a weak one strongly depends on the product geometry and on the material. Let me now summarize the problem description. As a consequence of the complexity of the problem, it appears not to be solvable by analytical means. As the process time as well as the simulation times are very long, it also appears not to be very promising to go for data-driven and machine learning approaches. An exception is when limiting the scope to a specific product class as Joost Duflu and his team have successfully shown. There is still a lack of experience beyond generic shapes. We found out that it is very difficult to discuss these problems adequately among the scientific community, 
and accordingly learning from collaborative experience is slow. The proposed solution approach is to connect our labs to a collectively learning worldwide lab. We plan to provide a platform for data exchange and experience exchange. It shall be web-based, it shall be able to collect data but also to provide data sharing among the users. The goal is to get accessible, searchable and comparable data from various labs and to effect enable effective handling of complex parameters such as path geometry, tool path, geometric deviations and so, and so on. At some point when we were thinking about this idea we needed an excellent sparring partner for discussion and a collaborating team in defining and installing a first version of such a platform. This was when we started the collaboration with the Catholic University of Leuven a year ago. Together with Joost Duflu and his team, we had various virtual meetings. Since then, trying to define necessary metadata, data formats and to solve other questions. There is still some way to go. But we believe that ICTP forms a perfect surrounding to ask for your feedback now. The current status is as shown in this concluding two-minute video. We have a web platform and you can upload your project data. Uh, you will be asked for different parameters describing the product, the tooling, the process processing. You can load up file, data files for the part geometry, for example. Um, you may visualize whether this upload was successful. You may define certain features of the product which you appear to be important, define the process parameters that have been used, add your own machine or add machine data. Uh, you can define then the tool geometry if it's two-point forming, verify whether that has been working correctly. Define the hemispherical type of tool that you have used for incremental sheet forming with its geometry um, and upload the tool path that was used. The same also holds then for the forming experimental results for geometric deviations and so on. Then once you may upload your project. On the other hand you may be interested to see what others have been doing so then you go to the download area and look for projects that have already been uploaded and then you can check what it is. You may download uh, the results including the process parameters that have been uploaded uh, and there is also a contact uh, to the uploading lab uh, and eventually links to any publication. We hope to finish this within the next months. We hope to extend it also for simulation results and simulation input so that we create a platform uh, that we can all use together. <clears throat> With this, um, I would like to conclude that version one of this metadata scheme is ready. Uh, the download features need to be added or completed or extended. We are in the way of uploading our current project data and with this we have seen and learned that loading up our old data becomes actually difficult because we did not save or find all these old metadata that would be necessary for a complete description. So at least for the future uh, we will be better off if we use the system already alone for ourselves but we would be happy to have you on board. And please let us know if you are interested, give us your feedback, give us your questions, your ideas, and uh, send us an email so that we can contact you back. With this, I thank you for watching, and we and Joost de Flu would be very happy to hear from you.